I have been always a strong believer in networks and the power of people working together around the networks. Mm. So what I do is to identify some of the networks which are aligned with the work I do and bring them together, strengthen them whenever we can. And sometimes I did actually encourage to start, to start from scratch. But if they are doing the work, I'm taking just the credit, you know? <laughs> so don't be very much impressed about this. With the UN, it's, uh, it's simply because we were talking about this just before we came here. Uh, we happen to, to have the, the privilege of being in certain platforms. And we need to uh, put there the voice of Africa, the face of African women. So what we are doing, actually, I'm taking your mandate to those bodies which the Secretary General is, uh, is uh, asking me to, to be part of. But coming to our talk this evening, I want to start also by saying what a privilege really for me to have an opportunity to share with you some thoughts. And uh, please lower your expectation. There's no lecture. <laughs> There's no lecture. I do not know how to do lectures. I have some kind of conversation with people. And then, of course, I appreciate if we can have uh, uh, a period of questions and answers. I've been asked to talk about rebooting for a value-based society. Value-based society. And I thought perhaps we should start by very quickly looking at what are the value systems around which many of us here have been socialized in. I will be focusing on the African uh, heritage because uh, that's what I know better by experience. I'm not excluding others, but it's uh, simply because I need to be a bit more specific. As Africans, we are socialized to think always at the image of the other. We never are educated and molded to focus on I or we. We say you and I, and then when we say we, is always in collective. In one sense, I'm saying the African identity of the being is a collective identity versus the individual individual identity which is being instilled according to many of the Western cultures. Uh, we talk very often of Ubuntu as a commonplace, but without really thinking deeply what it means. When you say, I am because you are, you are saying, I do not exist without you. And that is the meaning of who we are. And when we say, Siabonan, when we greet, did you hear me? We say, Siabonan, si. It's a plural, okay? When you say Morweni, it's a plural. And you don't address an adult, a child doesn't address a child, a, 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 an adult or an elderly person and saying you. You say Nijani, it's a plural. The reflecting the, the knowledge and the wisdom an elderly person is carrying as someone who represents <coughs> generations which have been. And a child recognizes that in an elderly person. So we are socialized always in these two ways of looking at ourselves, of the collective, of the respect of the 
elderly and even respect of the family. Let me give you some examples. It's not by chance that uh, a marriage in African custom, it is not a marriage of two. It is a coming together of two families. You know that. And two families negotiate, actually, to know who are you and to understand the cultural way of being of the family which is coming to us for our child, our girl. And they meet, they communicate to come to take responsibility that the family, the new nucleus family which is going to be formed is within the cultural understanding of uh, the two broad families. You don't have in our, in our culture what sometimes happens in other parts of the world where a child comes and says, I'm getting married next week. It doesn't happen like that. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that in our... But it, it, it's just to say, it is entrenched in the way we understand, and I'm coming here to a very strong social institution, family. There's no family of two. There's family of two brother families. Then we say it takes a village to raise a child. It means the child who is born, it doesn't belong only, you see, to the two families I spoke about, but it belongs to the broader community around. And all the other grown-ups in that community, they take a responsibility to raise that child, to see how a child grows, how behaves. The value systems which are transmitted to that child are not done only within the privacy of this, the, the family, but it's also collectively. When you have, for instance, um, a child who is born, the celebration of this it is again a collective event. Particularly because we as humans, we are challenged with the phenomenon of death. There it's no longer family alone. It's even neighbors, even family who you do not know of, but if there's death in one family, everybody goes in and everybody gives support. Everybody warms your heart in moments of loss, etc. What does it mean that our value system, which anchors a human being, is always a collective value, of collective value? And why this has been important in our resilience is because even in times of storm, when the family is strong, when the family is together, then you navigate better against the storms. So part of who we are, how we are grounded and rooted in some space, it is guaranteed by this collective way of being. Now, our languages, which we have not studied enough, and I would encourage the university here to look precisely of, uh, within the social science, but specifically to understand the philosophy of life which is being kept. Our languages are actually the custodians of our uh, heritage, because that's where we express ourselves. In, in a way, sometimes you say, I can't translate this in English, right? Yes. I can't translate this in Portuguese, you see. And that is something we should cherish. We should really instill more and more of how do we conceive, we understand ourselves within the universe, of universe of human relationship, but also the universe of our relationship with the nature. Africans will tell you, according to the moon, according to the seasons, 
What is happening in B? We say everyone, it's astrology, but if we have a specific way of uh, expressing how nature talks to us and how we relate to nature. So I wanted us to start by this value system, which I'm not going to elaborate in detail, but this is what ground us, or it should continue to ground us. Then in South Africa we have this beautiful, I will take you back a little bit to even to our Freedom Charter. The Freedom Charter, which influenced actually the Constitution, is the guiding principles and values of South Africans who, or everyone who live in it. It's not only to be born there, but it, you live here and you are embraced by the we, the people of South Africa. That's how the, the Freedom Charter starts. And the Constitution, again, it also started the same way. That we, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of our past, but we honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land. We respect those who have worked to build and develop our country and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. This is the framework of the value system we, 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 we adopt as a modern, if you like, a, a, a modern society. We pledge also, when we adopt the Constitution, to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on the democratic values, social justice, and the fundamental human rights. It's important to remember this. And we say, we lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law, improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. This is the boundaries in which we say the value system, which combine what I said as African knowledge and uh, African way of being, but now enriched by these uh, fundamental values which are enshrined in our constitution. So, I want to take you to some reflection of uh, why do we have some values and leave we are not living up to those values. I'm not going to be a, a, a conclusive, but we have been witnessing more and more brutalities against each other. Today, I don't want to talk about the top down. I want to talk about the human relations. How many cases we hear of people, particularly women and children, who are assaulted? And according to some statistics, you know, they say children, one in every three young South Africans have experienced some form of sexual abuse in their lives. One in three. And they are children. They are young people. We do hear of uh, near daily reports on gang rape, sexual assault in school grounds. When I said the first one, it's in the home. Now I'm talking of school grounds. <coughs> Every three days, a child is killed due to abuse and neglect. 
that is like a nightmare to us. The child murder rate for South Africa is more than double the global average. And we hear this, and we seem to have, get, uh, have, we seem to have got used, used to it. We hear and we carry on with our lives as if it doesn't have anything to do with us. We learn also through statistics that 40% uh, of men assault their partners daily and nearly half of men are abusing their women every single day. And we know a woman dies at the hands of her intimate partner every eight hours. So every day there are at least three women in South Africa who die in the hands of their partners. Why I'm saying this? It has to do with the human relations, with the human response or lack of response to the values I talked about at the beginning. You know, in, in, in African uh, settings, at least the traditional ones, even the households and the villages were built somehow to become some, some kind of round so that in, at the middle, you have children and women and elderly to be protected if anything happens. Even the configuration of how the household works. Children are considered to be a sacred, a sanctity of life of a child. And women are revered because they are considered to be like the continuation of what God has given to human species to reproduce ourselves. So women are revered. Elderly people are mentioned already. So what happens, what really happens when you hear stories of an adult who assaults a child of nine months of age, of two years of age, what is happening? And you will say, well, but this person is insane. Of course he is insane. But how low we have come when these kind of issues happen in our society, regardless of any sense of boundaries. Let me come to another example. What we see in our schools, children assaulting other children, and sometimes even taking uh, pictures and uh, going viral, etc., etc. It's an indication <coughs> of generations which have no sense of boundaries, of what is wrong, what is right. They have no sense. And now we have to ask, what has happened if we get to that situation? Part of it we can say, South Africa has at least three generations of parents, at least the three generations of parents who have not been brought up in a structured family. You remember the migration system? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have people who have grown up without the the, the, the space in which you build that sense of love and care of principles or values I was talking about, they never had. Then they become parents, and their children become parents as well. And you have a system in which generations after generations, they have never experienced that, I mean, precious environment which many of us have had in our own families. And this is something we have to take note. Mm -hmm. Then we have the impact of HIV, which also has robbed a, a great deal of a generation of uh, parents, and then children are brought up by grandmothers, so, and then some of them actually, <laughs> children are bringing up other children. Mm -hmm. They never had a normal family, 
which would help them to develop this sense of uh, boundaries and understanding what you do or what you cannot do. But in the meantime, the movements also from rural to urban has broken the village community which I was talking about. It doesn't exist anymore. In the sense that the, the, this, the, the idea of it takes a village to raise a child, in these townships where we are, we are no longer a village. So there is no the community responsibility which all the families around will be raising this child, these children, within a certain context. I'm sure you have heard also of statistics which say something like 40% of children in this country, they are living with their mothers, not because the fathers have died, sometimes they are somewhere else, but they are not with their mothers. So these children are also living in families, growing in families where they don't have a father figure. It's only the mother. And then it's mothers who are working, and most of the time they leave the children into an institution while they are going to earn a living for themselves and these children alone. We have dilemmas in our society which have broken the systems which were, I mean, the pillars of the values we are talking about. So, when I raise this, we can say value-based society. It is important to say the most important, in my view, the most important unit to develop those values is the family, where you come from. And if all of us, if you think really, you, you, you see the difference where you have come from, what you were given as love and care and guidance as a family. And we have, and I'm saying, South Africa has the crisis because we have too many families which are unstructured. And this is going on and on. Then we have also schools, which as I mentioned, not always because they are either because they are too big, either because the parents are not paying much attention to what's going on in schools. Even our school governing bodies, sometimes they do work, other times they do not work. So the school alone is failing to, be, to become the second home for a child to be built in certain values, okay? For me, there are three institutions which are fundamental to build this value system. It's the family, it's the school, and it's a religious place. And I'm saying religious place, I don't want to call it church, because if you are a, a, a Muslim, there's no church, there's, 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 there's mosque. But a religious space where families regularly do go and they have that sense of uh, solidarity, of working together. These three institutions, when they work properly, they complement one another mm -hmm. and they give a child a space to understand exactly how you become a social being. And as a social being, what are your responsibilities, but also what society has to give you and to provide you as a space in which you navigate. Because of this crisis, I think our value system, our value systems now, our value systems are under threat. Why, why does it happen when we have we read newspapers, we listen to, we watch television, we hear all these things, but you don't seem to have a sense of outrage? Do you hear? Do you hear outrage? Do you see movements of outrage to say, enough is enough, this is not us, we cannot continue to have this as part of what defines us as society. Where are the women's groups? To come out and say, gender violence? No. Women's bodies are not to be used like that. And also to say, we, as women, we are not going to take the breath, but we'll take, I mean, the lead in changing 
because at the end of the day also we are mothers of these young people. <coughs> Where are the women's movement? The outreach, one sense, but also taking responsibility. I can give credit to young people, at least in universities. They have come out, young people, they have come in universities against rape, against insecurity in campuses. Here at Rhodes, you had a case, but in many, I mean, I'm related to, to, to UCT and we are, we are grappling with this kind of thing, but it's young people who are coming up and say, we are not going to accept it, we need protection. But we don't hear from other levels of society the outrage to dissociate ourselves with, because yes, we are 56 million of South Africans. It's not all of us. There are perhaps, I don't know, I have no sense of how many millions, but perhaps one million people who are doing this and they are not isolated. They don't feel the pressure from society that we are not going to allow you to continue to do this and to make the pressure which at the village level use it to exist. You go out of the norms and the village will be there. And the way systems to say, ah, 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 this is not accepted. Mm -hmm. And we don't have, we don't hear this today. That's about people's behavior. But it also comes even with our political leadership. We all say, oh, but corruption. Have we really come up strongly against corruption? Or we seem to talk about it? We are uneasy about it. But have we sent a very strong and clear message that we are not going to tolerate leaders who are corrupt? Have we? I'm talking of outrage again. Have we come strongly, to come strongly, and say, leaders who are elected to serve, if they don't serve, then they don't deserve to be leaders. No, we talk about it. But when the moment of truth comes, we continue to elect exactly the same way. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that we seem as a society, have, uh, we seem to have become overwhelmed and we tolerate, that's what I want to say. We have a high level of tolerance to violence. So violence, yes, it's part of us and it's as if it's normal. Other people would say we have normalized violence as a part of our life. And we have normalized corruption as part of our life. We have accepted that, yes, it's not right for a public figure to behave A, B, C, D, but it's fine. It's fine because he or she can be there, can continue to be there. I'm bringing it to society because this is what I'm, I've been asked to talk about. Mm. What kind of society are we? We have these very high levels of tolerance. Tolerance of violence, tolerance of corruption, tolerance of behaviors which are not the ones we have first spoken about in our constitution. So we as South Africans also, we tend to look at uh, our challenges and say, oh, the government and the judiciary, let me come again to issues of uh, gender violence. When you hear voices is that the police has to act much better, the prosecutors have to do their job, and the judges have to be, it is important for them to do that. We want them to do that. But listen, violation of women, it happens in the privacy of our home. Yes. So there is no judiciary system which will be in every single house to tell people how they should behave to respect the children, to respect the elderly, to respect their wives. There's no police for that. Our police is us, mm. as human beings. Our behavior, uh, the way we, 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 we look at those things and we, we, we live with them, 
without the courage, the courage to say no. <coughs> I'm bringing this to say value-based society resides in living the values of the places, of those basic institutions which uh, I mentioned, our families, our schools, our churches and mosques. It has to be a daily behavior and daily attitude of every single one of us. We don't lack definition of principles. No, we do. We do have that. And they're very clear. And you will find in many times research and research about it. But it's about how you live them in detail of your life. And we have to question ourselves, how do we go there? And now to panelists, because I've been too long. I want to challenge um, our tertiary institutions to give us the kind of, I will call it the architecture of how we begin to address these ills of our society. Because perhaps we do not know, all of us, how do we begin to <coughs> leak the wounds, to heal, and then to empower ourselves to be healthy in our spirits and our minds. Perhaps we do not know how to do it. But science can help us to give us at least the architect. And I'm appealing that it's the responsibility of our tertiary education, our tertiary institutions, particularly our social sciences, social science departments, our researchers, really to build a coalition in which we begin to say, if we are to touch our own souls, if we are to change our minds, and if we are to change our behavior, if we are to be sharp against injustices, then we need to have this kind of social architect, not in abstract. So I would say, Rhodes, thank you for inviting me. But I came now, I, gave, I have given you a task. <laughs> and I would want to hear from you. Two days ago, I was uh, at UWC, University of Western Cape. And I left them also <coughs> with uh, sort of a similar task, but in a different angle. But my point is simple. We don't seem to have a, a clear approach to our own transformation as human beings. We have plans which are the constitution, the political ones. We have laws. We have institutions and we have regulations, you name it. But this is outside. I'm talking about the inside of ourselves, our inner self. How do we deal with it? And then it can come to issues of uh, gender acceptance, racial acceptance. And yes, you can say many times, and I have heard this and I know it is part of it, it is poverty. Listen, it's not all pe poor people who are rapists, who are abusers. It's not only poverty. That's what I want to say. I don't minimize it. But I don't think we, we are hiding into issues which are not necessarily of our total responsibility individually 
because it's part of the system. It's the government which has to do this. If it's someone else to do, we are quick to understand the problem. But when it comes to question ourselves in our behavior, we hide and we don't have a plan. That's what I'm going to say. So yes, let's make pressure on those who are running our public life to do it better. But let us accept that we, as individuals, in our inner self, we also need a plan of healing. Mm. And that healing, I can't find it anyway. And I bring it to you as an institution which has extremely qualified people who have the tools of analyzing human behavior and to tell us how do we undo these things so that we can have a future in which we acknowledge, we respect, we value the dignity, and I'm unscored, the dignity of every single one of us. You are a child, you are young, you are adult, you are old, you are black, you are white, you are yellow, you are red, whatever you are, but you are a human being, and mm. because of that, you have the dignity which everyone has to respect. Mm. That's where we have to go. And you have to tell us, how do we get there? Please remember that it, with all the imperfections which the older generations, I'm talking of those generations on somebody I'm close to, you know very well. <laughs> <laughs> with all the imperfections of what they have uh, uh, led us to the best, uh, absolutely the best gift they have given to all of us is freedom. Mm -hmm. And that we should never question. Mm -hmm. And so with freedom comes responsibility. And with that responsibility is that yes, you are free to be yourself, but you don't have the right to infringe mm -hmm. in the rights of the others. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So that's the first. The second one is uh, you are asking, but how can we, as young South Africans, how can we do you? I'm talking of the individual, etc. I think what you have uh, as a, a students' organization, talking of universities, because that's where you are, but you have students' organizations, you have youth organizations in your churches, you have cultural organizations in which young people are working together. That's the space. That's the space I would say, take it very seriously. Because transformation also has to be uh, achieved, and has to be worked on, and to be achieved collectively, as I said. You have to work on your own imperfections as individual, but within a context of a collective. And if you look back, particularly in the history of Africa, you know, the, the, the biggest change makers, they came from students' movements. Just look back. They came from students' movements. So it's also the responsibility of uh, students' movements of today to dream big and also to say what kind of South Africa, in this case, what kind of South Africa we want to live for your children and grandchildren. And work on that collectively. You know, when the Sisulus and others started, I mean, to, of course they were really, I, I even asked them, but how did you know that you are going to achieve freedom in your lifetime? Because I would think it had been a, an impossible job. Perhaps they could have, we started this, even if we don't leave it to see it. But they were very convinced that they are going to achieve freedom in their lifetime, and they did. Now you also, you have to devise clearly what are the challenges of your time, of your historical time, and what do you want to achieve, for instance, in the next 10, 20 years. As you are active, you are at the best of your energy as young people, and actually, with much better tools as education as you have. And you have also the opportunity of connecting with the experiences of other people in the world in a question of seconds, which those generations in the past, they didn't have that. 
They had to go one by one of the countries to mobilize. No, you can mobilize, I mean, sitting at roads as you are. You mobilize the country, you mobilize the world. So with the, with the, with the privileges which you have, I think uh, for me, it's a, an, an opportunity to decide exactly in which way you want to make a mark in history, in changing our society. Now, some of you might have come from families which I mentioned, which you have some emotional gaps. I understand that. Then perhaps it's also an issue to say, what do we do with those children who have these emotional gaps? And it's not their fault. It's a simply, they were not provided with the environment to do that. What do we do with young people who have this? I don't have the answers, my son. I don't have the answers. I'm raising issues which we have to deal with, and perhaps collectively to say, what do we do? Except that we cannot continue to ignore it and to move ahead as if nothing is happened with us. The third one was uh, silence from very influential people. Well, uh, I will I'll respond about me personally, but first I want to say there are very influential people in this country who have come out in an organized way, the so-called stalwarts. Mm. You can't find a better way. These are ANC people. They fought. I mean, now they, most of them, if you see them when they meet, really they are old, but they gave their youth exactly for the organization and for the freedom of our country. When they take the courage to come and question their own organization, their own leader, and to say, this is not the organizations we fought for. I don't think you need another expression of, uh, yeah. Now, if you ask, why you, Mrs. Michelle, you're not coming openly, because that is it. <laughs> that is what you're asking. I, I, I'm going to be very frank. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very frank. You know, um, I, I am Mozambican by, by birth, okay? And uh, I married somebody who was, uh, uh, I don't know how many times taller than I am. <laughs> and um, I made a choice. I made a choice that uh, it would be complicated for me to be politically active in the sense you are asking of being very vocal, you know, in South Africa. It would be problematic. And I don't want to go to our family history and our family relationships and all this. There are people who are better positions to be vocal, and they are in the Mandela family than I am. But I chose to be active through Madiba's institutions. I've been while he was still with us, and I am until today, through the Nelson Mandela Foundation, through the, the, the Children's Fund, and through the recent, the, 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 the Children's Hospital, which we managed, fortunately, to build after Madiba passed on. It's a way of being there, but without challenging the space of other members of our family. You see what I'm trying to say? Mm. You understand where I'm, I'm getting to? <laughs> okay. I'm not in putting myself in a, in a situation where I say it is not my business. It is absolutely my business. And for instance, through the, the foundation, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, we organize different kind of dialogues with different people, including with political leaders. We don't make it, I mean, such public stuff, but to be in a room to say, hey guys, what is happening here? I don't know whether you know, for instance, we, we did also facilitate, not alone, we did facilitate discussions about with, with the, with the uh, fees must, must fall leadership. Not to question, I mean, the right to, 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 to students to do that. The only thing we were saying is, uh, 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 don't destroy property. Isn't it possible to have kind of organizations where 
20 families in a neighborhood, I'm saying 20 because I think it's manageable, 20 families coming to know one another, supporting one another, and even when there isn't a mother, but in other ladies can be mothers to this child. You see what I'm trying to say? I know it will require a lot of energy to make it work because we have taken for granted that the fact that we are in towns, we cannot recreate the connections, the community connections, which are still existent in rural areas. But we can reconstruct them. It's a question of deciding this. Let me give you an example. Tanzania has a system of what they call 10 families. Julius Nyerere was brilliant on this. Whether you are in town or you are in, the, in rural areas, people are organized in groups of 10 families, which means in every 10 families, there's one or two people who know and they, who take the work of making people know each other, support one another, and to, to, to bring close to become that community, even in urban areas. Ten families, this is how they call it. Let me give you an example. My trust tried to understand the issue of <clears throat> children who are out of school. Tanzania has a quite number, I mean, millions of children who are out of school. And we went to five districts, and we said to them, look, you have children who are out of schools. What are the reasons? We know the easy ones but it's the difficult ones. And we went exactly to the structure of 10 families. Through the 10 families, we were able to identify every single family which had children who were out of school, to profile the children, to profile the family, to understand the causes, you know, because society is organized. We would have never been able to do this without this system of 10 families. So I'm challenging, for instance, any one of us here, we live somewhere. We are here at the university, but we live somewhere. And in our church groups, for instance, we have the mothers and we have the groups of fathers, etc. Et Let's begin to look and say, our society needs some kind of structure. We need to organize ourselves. I do not know how to do it because it's not... It's simply an anguish which I came to share with you and say you are in a better position to produce some kind of architecture. You remember I said architecture? Yeah, you are in a better position to produce architecture. So baby girl, don't bring it back to me because I don't know. Yeah, and then the issue of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, fees must, uh, must, uh, must, must fall. This is a very hot issue, and you know I'm coming also from uh, uh, UCT. You know, I really understand, and I have the, 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 the best of uh, empathy with students to uh, 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 demand free education. That is, that is unquestionable. That is unquestionable. The, 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 the thing which I, I, I am a little bit biased also because I am, I am from the, the side of the adult side of the, the structures and so you, you are also very suspicious of uh, what we say as structures of universities. I think we need to have, <coughs> sorry, better communication so that whether it's the council of the university whether it's the management, whether it's the students' unions, to communicate better about the challenges and the limitations which do exist. So that, believe me, there's no management of university which is here and deliberately is working against students. No, the reason why they are there, it's precisely because of students. Otherwise, they wouldn't be at university. What happens is the understanding of uh, the possibilities and the limitations to meet, for instance, free education for all, I don't think is the same. And because it's not communicated in an environment of uh, calm and serenity, 
where you can digest the explanation from the other side and also you put your own views forward but in an environment where we can listen many times we shout and we don't listen to each other and that is a problem for me and that is a problem so you are saying what i was saying here is that whatever are the, 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 the means you want to use don't play against yourself and don't play against your younger brothers and sisters because these libraries and these buildings are to serve you for you to complete your education but they have to serve other generations of your younger brothers and sisters who have to come here if you burn because you are angry it plays against yourself and it plays against those young generations that's all i'm saying that's all i'm saying and i'm saying All I'm saying is that the respect for, for public property and collective property, it is these, these properties, these ones. It is, uh, believe me, it's the blood of your parents who built this. You see what I mean? This is a product of the struggle of your parents and grandparents for you to have this. So if you want, you, you have to cherish. You have to protect it for yourself and as I'm saying for the other generations which are going to come be, be, uh, 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 be after you. So make your case. Put your case as clear as you can. As strong as you can. But please respect the blood of your parents and grandparents and also protect this for the sake of yourself. Because if you burn this amphitheater, then tomorrow, where are you going to be sitting and have lessons? And what, as I said, was about the generations to come. So that, that's, that's, that's my point. And finally, I want to say this, which is very controversial as well. I know it's controversial, but I want you to think about it. At least the conversation we are having with the, some of leaders is the following. We need to categorize our students. They are students, perhaps the majority, who would need to have 100% of a free education, tertiary. There will be some in the middle here who might not have to have 100%. They can have 75%, depending on the agreement of how the university can afford. And then there will be others who can pay, because they can. Mm -hmm. And when they can, they're not doing it for themselves alone. They are contributing for the university to be able to finance those who will need the 75% and those who will need 100%. You see what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And we did have, in, at UCT for instance, parents who came and say, you know what, we can pay and we are ready to continue to pay, and even more, we are prepared to contribute for a fund which is going to allow those children who cannot pay so that they can have the same possibilities. It is a question of, of the budget of the university as we speak. I'm talking of UCT, and I don't want to be involved in roads. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I don't know how things are here. I'm just giving example, okay? We, we say, as we stand, for us to be able to absorb more students coming, for us to give the quality of education we want to, for us to be able to, do, to provide the resources for research because our tertiary institution, it's not a secondary school where you're just teaching. You need to research, you need to have publications and all this stuff. For us to continue to do that, the budget of the university cannot afford to give to everyone. But there's a more important principle, <laughs> is that once you decide in 2017 that education is free, I mean tertiary education is free for everybody, it is going to be that from now forever. It is not a measure for your generation alone. And that is the problem of saying the economy of South Africa 
can afford to bring from primary to tertiary totally free education or not. So it's not only the tertiary institutions which are at stake. It's also the other, I mean, flow of groups which have to come. Once you institute this principle, you have to give it to, all, to everyone forever. You don't go back anymore. And this is the kind of a conversation where many times we don't have in a peaceful... You know why you are listening to me now? Do you know why? Because I'm not a Rhodes uh, member of council. <laughs> 